right now on Higher Journeys Radio with Alexis Brooks. Is there a science to the UFO and ET contact experience? For a field of study that is still regarded with much speculation, there's one individual that would argue that a scientific method for understanding this complex web of contact experience is long overdue. And that's internationally recognized neuroscientist and a former professor at the State University of New York, Dr. Bob Davis. What began as a passion for understanding the reality of non-human intelligence after having his own up-close UFO sighting has led him to serve as a board member of FREE, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. Bob brings such a measure of academic integrity to the subject, but with a healthy dose of humility and curiosity. A combination that no doubt will bring us closer to understanding what this mysterious phenomenon is really all about. Bob, I am absolutely delighted to have you here today. And I'm especially excited because you, being such an integral part of an organization that I completely support called FREE, and everyone get ready, this is a long title. This is the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters, FREE. FREE is doing something that I've not yet come across in my own research into this elusive area of inquiry, I would say. And that's connecting the dots when it comes to individuals who have had contact experiences, in addition to other phenomena, which one would deem as anomalous, like near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, incidents of remote viewing, channeling, the list goes on. But here's the kicker, Bob. Much of the data that you have captured, which is nicely laid out in a paper that you co-authored called UFO Contact with Non-Human Intelligence and the Quantum Hologram Theory of Consciousness. This paper, among other things, is intimating that contact with non-human intelligence is happening via many of these other paranormal type experiences like NDEs, OBEs, etc. And that's what I really want to focus our talk on today. Now, I know there's a lot of meat to this story based on the cornucopia of evidence that Free has compiled through through the research. Uh, so I want to get into some of the aspects, uh, but connecting the dots with this phenomenon, I think it's brilliant. So welcome, Dr. Bob Davis to Higher Journeys. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you on your exceptional show. I'm 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 a big fan of you and your oh. your work and your books and uh, and your show. So thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you, and I know it's going to be a, a fun conversation. In fact, folks, we've just been chatting it up. <laughs> we we could we could have hit the record button about a half hour ago uh, yeah. because we we've just been really digging into the subject. So I think we should dig in right now. I want to I, I want to first set the table for what we're talking about here. And that's about the compiling of exhaustive exhaustive data from individuals uh, of all ages, I would imagine, all ethnic and cultural backgrounds, all geographic locations, with one common denominator. And that's each of these individuals' information has been gleaned through conscious recall. That's a big deal, isn't it? Well, we, we'd like to think so. It does add a certain degree of validity to the overall responses, uh, especially when the scientific community is going to interpret our evidence obviously they they do not regard hypnotic reg- regression as as a kind of modality that uh, mm. offers you know accurate and valid recall so again we're just uh, relying on the individual's perspectives and they do claim uh, that they have had conscious recall of of such ufo related and in, uh, experiences which also incorporates interaction with non-human intelligences associated with a ufo mm-hmm. okay well i do want to get into uh it's interesting that you should bring up um uh, hypnotic regression as a mo- as a modality but not one that is considered as uh valid in terms of revealing what is um, particularly with re- uh, related to contact experiences. But anyway, nonetheless, I want to get into that later because that too, it, it's still a very interesting uh, process. And uh, Mary Rodwell, who my audience certainly knows, and you are a colleague of Mary, has, uh, that's where a lot of her work lies. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. We got a lot to get to before we get to mm-hmm. that. Um, 
you know, as I became aware that Free was focusing uh, some of the research on the interrelationship between all of these phenomena with non-human intelligence, or we could even use the acronym NHI, uh, the, that contact aspect, I asked myself, you know, I wonder how these experiences rolled out for the various individuals. Kind of a chicken and egg scenario uh, or question, I suppose. In other words, which came first? Assuming a lot of these individuals who have had contact experiences have also had perhaps NDEs, OBEs, uh, channeling, or other mystical experiences. What came first, you think, Bob? In, in Not in all cases, obviously, but in some, were the contact experiences inclusive of this other phenomena or the other way around? I mean, how would you delineate, if you could, that. Well, that that's a critical question, one that I uh, ask myself. It, it does represent a confounding variable because approximately 30% of our uh, approximately 4,000 subjects who participated in our survey, uh, the results of which are presented in uh, research papers that will be in the Journal of Consciousness and the Journal of Scientific Exploration uh, this year. Uh, approximately 30% reported to have had a near-death experience, and about 70% claimed to have had an out-of-body experience, which is remarkably high in incidence relative to uh, you know, statistics regarding the occurrence of such uh, unusual events in the general population, which is probably not accurate to begin with. But that is, that is a very insightful question because the very positive psycho-spiritual outcomes reported by approximately 80 to 85 percent of our subject population uh, contend that they occurred as a direct result of their UFO contact experience. However, However, the fact that so many have had prior anomalous experiences like the NDE and the OBE, that too may have contributed in some way hmm. to this positive uh, behavioral transformative outcome that they claim to have had. And we need to, and we intend to, uh, further explore the questions that you just asked in separate groups, mm -hmm. those that have NDEs and OBEs, which is certainly a part of the NDE phenomenon. Right. That's right. For those that have had NDEs, we can assume that there, there was an OBE aspect, of, of course, to it. Yeah, I know it's a complex question. I, I really... You know, and again, because we tend to think linearly what came first versus after, mm -hmm. but maybe it was a confluence of all of the above, or maybe one thing triggered or not another. But the other thing, if I'm understanding understanding correctly, Bob, and I have, by the way, folks had the privilege of reading uh, the quantum quantum hologram theory of consciousness paper, which is um, brimming with with information. Um, my question, if I don't lose my focus here, <laughs> oh. In terms of the, let's say an individual is having a, a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience or a shamanic journey, might, within the, within the context of the encounter, the OBE, are they meeting up with uh, non-human intelligence? I don't know if that's, it's kind of part of the same question that I asked before, but um, are, Again, how are they connected? Are, are, are people seeing uh, non-human species in the NDE state, in the OBE state, uh, or remote viewing? And I want to get into the remote viewing because I have, an, I have a, a thought on that. Well, just the other day, I, I, the thought occurred to me, which is very similar to the question you're asking. When people contend that they are interacting with non-human intelligences, uh, does that mean they are physically hmm. on board a craft or can a certain aspect of their, let's say, uh, non-physical nature or possibly their consciousness is on board the craft as their body is still in, in bed or somewhere on the planet, so sure. to speak? Hmm. And, and that is a distinction, I think, that also needs to be addressed through further uh, research, and, and we, I plan to do just that uh, because s s people who obviously have NDEs 
claim to meet deceased relatives and other um, powerful beings, call it God or whatever, but likewise, people who also uh, report experiencing this UFO phenomenon also contends that they interact with a supreme being of some type. Mm -hmm. uh, but more often than not, it is a, a human-looking entity that's very similar to our physical appearance, along with, of course, interactions with greys, reptilians, mantids, and all the other uh, noted species, supposedly. But the question remains uh, is whether or not this UFO experience is uniquely similar to other phenomena like the NDE. And in fact, a noted psychologist Kenneth Ring wrote the book, The Omega Project, mm -hmm. whereby he studied UFO and NDE uh, uh, experiencers and noted remarkable similarity in terms of their positive behavioral transformations and value shifts that occurred in each separate group. Uh, and what's you, interesting is that we are also seeing the same outcomes uh, from his study, which hmm. I believe he did back in the 1980s. So the question is, why are these individuals reporting to have an increase in so social concern, an increase in spirituality, uh, uh, appreciation more of life and self worth, compassion towards others, telepathy, a, a belief now in life after death. It's a, a very pervasive pattern of, of uh, uh, powerful mm -hmm. psychophysical changes that seems un unique to each uh, phenomena. Uh, so there could very well be some other underlying mm -hmm. foundation or reason why people are having this so-called awakening or, or, or paradigm shift that that doesn't really, it's not unique to just UFOs or NDEs or OBEs or shamanic journeys. Uh, there is something else that interrelates all of these phenomena, and that may very well incorporate consciousness. I was just going to say, how can you not? Consciousness, that big C word, there it is again. And I don't, I'm not being facetious, but yeah, as you were talking, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, wow. Well, th th that's the big question. I think that all of us that are in uh, whatever aspect of this research and experience, because I think that too is interrelated. I don't think one can exist without the other. Um, that's the big question. What is the underlying or what is undergirding all of these uh, experiences that would be considered uh, outside of the 3D realm? And that there's a lot um yeah. is there one thing and is that one thing consciousness i absolutely agree yeah. uh yeah. i don't know it, i'm it, sorry go ahead continue it, it may very well be uh consciousness itself uh right. that that is what people are reporting um because when people come to the revelation or realization that they are more than just a physical body. Mm -hmm. In other words, they are also a spiritual um, and non-physical body. Um, that revelation, as if they know they have five fingers on their hand, it's realer than real. Once mm -hmm. they realize that through whatever means, and it could again be through a UFO, NDE, out-of-body experience, even a hallucination through ayahuasca, whatever it may be, seems to trigger this type of intense personal transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, call it a psycho-spiritual uh, attribute or call it an awakening, a kundalini awakening, mm -hmm. call it a trigger for change, whatever, whatever term is popular nowadays. The point is they're different from that moment forward, generally in a much more positive and thus more humane mm -hmm. way. Uh, they they tend to exhibit qualities of of life that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. They become more humane, more loving and caring, compassionate, um, more spiritual, as I mentioned before. And and the question, of course, is why? And what is that underlying interrelated aspect to all of these phenomena that possibly ties it together? And what we feel is, yes, you're right, consciousness could be that that foundational aspect of the individual that allows for this outcome to 
occur. Now, what we're trying to do as well along these lines is to bridge the gap between science and consciousness or try to uh, better understand the nature of reality of which consciousness, awareness of oneself, the I, our essence, um, whether or not that that uh, awareness is distinctly different than the brain and what gives rise or facilitates that. And neuroscientists, of course, cannot uh, accurately identify mm. where consciousness exists in the brain and maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe it's not the That's material right. brain. That's right. I don't know, uh, Bob, if you had a chance to watch my, my one of my most recent shows with uh, Nassim Harriman, which we did on location, and that exactly was the discussion. Of course, he's brilliant and really trying to get to the crux of, you know, where is consciousness coming from? Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about a phenomenon called brainlessness, people that are literally living normal lives with very little brain matter. Um, which begs the question, okay, if, if they're able to think and perform and, 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 and live relatively normal lives then, and have no brain, let's, let's do the math here. Something else is, is, is driving consciousness. So yes, um, I, I think that we're, we're there. I think we're pretty, it's pretty conclusive. As far as I'm concerned. Oh yeah, oh yeah, just like, exactly, just like uh, ESP remote viewing. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, is is a valid phenomenon that's been documented uh, by many experiments conducted at Stanford University mm -hmm. and, and and Princeton through the uh, through their peer that's PAR right. laboratories. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but yet, the general scientific community doesn't acknowledge it because it obviously upsets the the scientific paradigm, uh, it's, which is not consistent with our current scientific principles. And that's what ties in uh, the, 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 the various uh, theories that fall under the <laughs> the term quantum physics, uh, the, right. the, the essence of matter, uh, and how do we explain uh, matter. Uh, and we know that subatomic particles act most weird, and, mm -hmm. and that has been documented as well. In other words, observation of subatomic particles can actually manipulate the physical aspects of their spin, their behavior, uh, among other physical attributes. The question is, the, the act of, of a, awareness, attention, alone can exert an influence over a physical system like subatomic particles has clearly been documented by Dean Radin, among many yes. others, in the double slit experiment. That's right. And the point is, of course, we're composed of subatomic particles. Thus, what implication does this strange, inexplicable behavior that does exist at the subatomic level? And many of your listeners, including Einstein, call it spooky action at a distance. He acknowledged it. The question is, what does that mean for us as physical beings composed of this weird substance called electrons and photons and uh, etc.? We, we can't explain it. And if you ask 10 different quantum physicists, uh, how do you explain consciousness? You're going to get 10 different answers, let alone the, the perspectives of, of philosophers and, and members of the general scientific community. No one, as far as I'm concerned, ha has the answer as to what governs and regulates consciousness. But getting back to your point, um, I did hear that interview um, that you mentioned. It was fascinating. Mm. And um, it, it, it goes, it kind of ties into the quantum hologram theory yes. of consciousness. I'm because, so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that, that essentially says um, you know, it, it, the brain can function quite normally. Uh, despite there maybe being 90% of it absent, mm -hmm. which, which and animal experiments have conclusively demonstrated this in varying ways, and, and individuals, uh, too, who, who lose many, a large percentage of their brain are, remain unaffected. The point is, it's possible that there could be um, so-called holographic uh, uh, principles that underlie the neuronal behavior of the brain, such that, such that, 
each neuron represents the entire brain. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, which is uh, the whole yeah, yeah. A, yeah, a piece of it. Uh, as if you take a big uh, uh, mirror and smash it into millions of pieces, each piece, however, can still function as a mirror. Each part, in in a sense, each little microscopic part represents the whole. That's right. And maybe, maybe that's what's going on with the brain. And there is some scientific uh, evidence to support that from um, – uh, Hammerhoff and Penrose uh, at the University of Arizona, who contend that that the brain does function like a, a holographic resonator mm-hmm. that interacts with our environment. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, they, 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 we're only at the very beginnings of trying to understand these these concepts, like the synchronized universe model that incorporates so many aspects of the quantum hologram theory of consciousness, and trying to explain the weirdness so to speak the weirdness. <laughs> of atomic behavior right. but also interrelating that to the kinds of phenomena that we are exploring well that's what i want to i want to get back to you're you're we're right in sync here we're in a synchronized universe at the moment because <laughs> i wanted to get into the quantum holo- hologram aspect uh get get into that dig into that a little bit more so here's here's the deal here, here's something that i've often pondered in terms of where, because this is what this paper is about, a a great deal of it, in terms of quantifying the validity of the experience of the contact experience, and that is the holographic model. Um, I want to talk about (laughs) wave particle duality a little bit, you know, let's back up for a minute, let's look at reality in general. and, And there are many that would argue that that we are living in a quantum hologram of sorts, even even some measure of a virtual reality. And in that reality, it's fluid and it's malleable. It's plastic is what uh, um, Michael, Ta- uh, Michael Talbot said in his book, mm-hmm. The Holographic Universe. It's both wave and particle. This is something that's always intrigued me, Bob, the idea that mm-hmm. the two coexist. If you look at the particle-like mm-hmm. aspect of reality on a macro scale, <clears throat> you would equate that with the material world, that which we can touch and see and smell, etc. But looking at the wave-like aspect of reality, which quantum theory contends coexists with the particle-like counterpart, it's less dense, of course, and well beyond our physical grasp. Now, here's the question. Assuming these multiple species, these non-human species exist, and in fact, interpenetrate our own dimension of existence, might they be existing in a more wave-like aspect versus a particle aspect? And that's why we as physical beings don't regularly encounter their presence. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Can I just say yes or no? (laughs) You can say whatever you want. (laughs) Uh, That's a that's a, a fundamental question, um, and I don't pretend to have the answer to that. Oh, we're just exploring. We're but, just exploring. Wow. It's you, okay. No pressure. You sound like a physicist, I'll tell you. But <laughs> it, essentially, that, that, that the quantum hologram theory of consciousness gets at that mm. with no definitive answer. But we can only speculate mm. with some math to support it, it's such that this uh, model developed by Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who co-founded Free, along with uh, Dr. Rudy Shield, and astrophysicist Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who, for members of the audience who may not know, was an uh, astronaut who walked on the moon and, mm-hmm. and, and founded the Institute for Noetic Sciences as well. Um, he expanded the, the, uh, the quantum hologram theory to incorporate the concept of consciousness. Um, and it, it essentially gets at just what you said in a very insightful way, that instead of being a three-dimensional uh, spatial construct, uh, this theory says that it's actually four-dimensional, uh, which incorporates the past, the present, and the future. In other words, time. And it's more like a holographic image that's built up by um, interacting vibratory waves and it's a model in other words that describes the basis for consciousness that's where mitchell was going and it and it kind of, sort of i guess you might say elevates the role of information in mm-hmm. nature to the same fundamental status as, as that of matter and energy and it serves this theory of mitchell's 
and which is advocated by members of free and is consistent with um, Dr. Swanson's synchronized universe model, uh, among other theories uh, out there. Uh, and they all do share similar aspects to it, but they serve as a basis for explaining how the, the whole of creation learns, self-corrects, evolves, uh, and is interconnected holistically. Yeah. And, and, and it goes further at, to ex- trying to explain subatomic uh, principles, the, the behavior of, of all matter contained in, in objects, which obviously include everything in our universe, such that the universe may even retain evidence of each event at, which is stored in a holographic form and can be retrieved by one's mind when one attends to it. And if that is true, in other words, non-locality, mm-hmm. if that's true, then our uh, physical senses and our brain might perceive the world as solid, but we may actually live within an energy matrix made up of higher dimensional realities mm-hmm. in in a, a, a physical dimensional property, which... Um, Beautifully you know. said. Beautifully said. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're, you're articulating this beautifully. Yeah, I mean, we can go from, you know, simple awareness, memory, instinct, empathy, uh, all the way up to um, more advanced uh, aspects of, of being that are reflected in an increasing resonance represented by telepathy, remote viewing, which is valid, even remote healing, uh, OBEs and NDEs, like this, this universal knowledge that some people uh, consider it the, the Akashic records, uh, that, that cosmic consciousness. Well, again, language, unfortunately, doesn't capture what we're talking about uh, uh, accurately in, for a variety of reasons, but there is an aspect of oneness or universal knowledge that is at the the, the, the the most evolved aspect of of what of consciousness, not simple awareness or memory or our instincts. That's brain stuff. When you get to uh, phenomena like the UFO interaction with non-human intelligences, NDEs, OBEs, etc., and the feeling of oneness, and that we are them and they are us, which a vast majority of subjects in our study say, they say we are all one. Mm-hmm. We, the, the non-human intelligence has, that they encounter, they, our subjects say we are them, they are us, we are all interrelated. Right. And people who have NDEs tend to say that as well, and that there is no space and there's no time. This altered perception that also appears quite vivid to these individuals um, comes across and when they say there's no time there's no space I can see 360 degrees um, yeah. I'm not limited by my brain's uh, inability to to uh, perceive reality now I'm free mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. I left my body and now it's a different reality yeah uh, we're seeing aspects of that in our in our study Excellent. and in these studies Right, right. Well, you know, again, and the audience probably getting sick of me saying it, but so many interviews that I've done, Bob, um, bring up, uh, you know, essentially the philosophy of whom I admired greatly, which is David Bohm, and a quote um, that I've used a million times, but it stands repeating here in terms of the interrelationship where he talks about whirlpools in a stream. He says, you know, whirlpools in a stream, you you can, how, how does he say it? The whirlpools all exist in a stream, but they don't have distinct borders. They're they're unique, but they don't have distinct borders. We are like whirlpools in a stream. In other words, we are distinct. We are individuals, but there are no borders between us. Thus, the interrelationship. Um, that's something that David Bohm made very clear. That's the way he saw it. So, well, listen, I want to, there is so much to get to. I want to talk, you mentioned before I I lose uh, track of this, remote viewing. Remote remote viewing is yet another, um, I guess you could call it a paranormal modality. I don't like that word paranormal. I'm going to try to refrain using it, but for the sake of argument. Um, as, As I was looking at this paper and really looking at where you were going again, with the interrelationship of contact experiences and and these sets of modalities, including remote viewing, 
you know, I thought of was uh, the late Ingo Swan. And I believe you mentioned SRI, Stanford Research Institute, of which he was integral in the remote viewing experiments. And many of you know that uh, Ingo Swan was considered, you know, uh, perhaps the greatest, one of the at least greatest remote viewers out there. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read his book, Penetration. Um, I know it's kind of difficult to get your hands on now, but I, I had the good fortune to to read it. But here's where I'm going with this. He discusses that during some of his remote viewing sojourns in the book, particularly uh, during a very mysterious project uh, he had been summoned to participate in, very interesting story, he speaks of being able to see, quote unquote, I put in quotes, <clears throat> excuse me, alien bases, remote viewing alien bases, and also human looking beings while remote viewing the moon. So this, although it's just one example, it's stunning, tells us right there that uh, via these other side type modalities, these beings have been countered, hence the data that is being sh showing up in your in your study. Uh, yes, and, and I, um, I can't say with absolute certainty that uh, that Ingo Swan um, is is actually re reporting what is valid uh, mm, interesting. in terms of document. You know, I'd like to ha have that documented, and there's many theories out there, but mm. I, I do know that remote viewing is valid. Uh, and our government here in the United States, as well as in Russia, you know, trained people to remote view. And Ingo Swan, I'm not sure if he was part of that uh, that research project to literally spy mm -hmm. on our uh, enemy during the Cold War, being yeah. uh, Soviet Union. But but it's related, of course, to telepathy and ESP and precognition and, and all of that good stuff. But at the core of that is that there could be an interaction of subatomic particles a across great distances and even time. And if that is what's occurring, uh, this synchronization or interaction, call it with with a parallel universes. I mean, we, hmm. we can get really out there in terms of some theories that, that exist in quantum mechanics to help try to explain these unique abilities like Ingo Swan has, among many other people, then it, it can help us to possibly better understand how two, uh, what, consciousnesses <laughs> hmm. can be linked uh, can be aligned despite being separated. And we see that kind of uh, separated in, term of, in terms of vast distances as well as time. And we see that kind of enigmatic behavior at the subatomic level where you can simply divide an electron and, and send it light years away and while manipulating one half of that electron that was once bound to that other half, manipulating one causes a, a direct influence on the physical state of, of the counterpart, the other half, despite it being remotely uh, located from the other half. So the point is, well, I don't see a connection. There's no, there's, there's no physical connection that I can see, but yet, hey, Manipulating it causes this kind of effect. Well, can we extrapolate from that behavior at the subatomic level to that of the mind or consciousness such mm -hmm. that I can intimately communicate with you or, or perceive something that is in a different space and time than where I am now standing? Uh, and this apparently is what people can do via ESP, remote viewing, etc., where space and time are not variables mm -hmm. that can impede one's ability to access information. Right. Wow. As I'm listening, and how many conversations have, have we all had in, in this circle, particularly about that dynamic, and I, I still shake my head. Uh, in just amazement that, that this is what we call, among other things, non-locality, the non-locality factor, which I think many of us have really had brushes with, whether it be through, I'm about to do a show uh, on someone else's radio program on synchronicity and uh, b being able to glean information or have information marry with, with us on a local level that's coming non-locally, non uh, coming from a non-local 
uh, space. <laughs> That's probably not the mm-hmm. right word to use, but it's it's amazing. It's stunning, and I think the evidence is overwhelming. I really do. You know, I want to I want to bring up a point. Um, in terms of getting back to the individuals that you surveyed and the overwhelming uh, amount of individuals who report having uh, their encounter experiences as being overwhelmingly positive and in fact uh, affecting their lives uh, in a positive way such that they, they, they shift um, their, their priorities. But I want to take the other side of that because I, I think I'd be interested in hearing what you'd have to say on this and maybe our audience as well. You know, let's say 80 percent. Would it be fair to say about 80 percent of the respondents said that their um, experiences, contact experiences were positive, right? Exactly. OK, so that leaves approximately 20 percent who didn't feel that way, I have to assume. I would like to know if you were able to capture this, Bob, what were some of the things that they described that weren't so positive about the experience? Um, And let me clarify that further. And that's Mm. an exceptional question. I have I I want to explore that further in our future surveys. It's actually um, about 50 percent say that their experience with UFOs and associated non-human intelligence was highly positive. About 22 percent said it was slightly positive. Only only 10 percent said it had a negative negative effect on their life the the remaining it wasn't 20 mm-hmm. percent that you had just mentioned because it was a okay. neutral category as well but I it's see. still 10 percent and that's a lot mm-hmm. yes and we it's need to a- explore that i agree um the point is what is negative about it uh and right it, it's 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 obvious that anyone who has a, a, an experience of that of that pronounced uh, manner in which they are now interacting with another form of intelligence in a a, a location that is totally inexplicable and they're being and communicating in a telepathic manner which is customarily the case uh, (laughs) obviously that's going to have uh, initially a very negative um, outcome mm-hmm. in terms of creating confusion fear anxiety understandably sure. um but the these interactions i don't like to use the term abductions when mm-hmm. they occur repeatedly over the person's lifetime and over 50 percent say it happens more than 10 times they adapt to it and they realize over time through multiple interactions that there's it's a very positive outcome but there is that small percentage who regard it as negative. And I want to explore that further. And we do have um, additional studies underway okay. in which to do so. Uh, uh, very insightful on your part. And maybe one characteristic of that 10% is that maybe they were abducted only one or two times and right. have yet adapt and realize a po- possible positive outcome. Right. Possibly. Or or that maybe it's specific to the species. Maybe they they in- interacted with uh, uh, mal- mal- uh, malevolent types of beings. So we can only speculate, obviously. Or they underwent medical procedures, which um, a good percentage say they do, maybe 20-30%, where they extract the, uh, the sperm and ova. Uh, many contend that it's a very painful procedure. Mm. It, you know, op, you know, performed with the uh, little support or very cold, um, uh, what personalities. Uh, so they they uh, they're very distrustful, scared, understandably, understandably and some do yeah. experience pain. So there's a many many variables that could give rise to that negative outcome as well as the positive outcome. We right. have plan to explore that much, much more in yeah. future studies. Yeah, I think that would be worth looking at it because one of my, the things I was going to throw out, assuming I had assumed that maybe you got a little bit of context for uh, the encounters that were negative and, and, and maybe in some cases, I don't know how the, the survey is structured, but maybe the negativity that they were reporting was the the outgrowth of as a result of having the experience was negative in terms of the ridicule and being bullied. That's a whole nother subject. But one of the, the, the questions I was going to ask is, I wonder if there might be any uh, of the experiencers, any personality delineators 
that might be able to be identified between those whose experiences were positive versus negative. In other words, it's relative to the person that's having the experience. Oh, without question. And mm. uh, uh, we have to further examine the psychological state of these individuals, all of whom contend that they were never diagnosed with a mental illness in our survey, but again, we're taking their word for it. Um, after reviewing a lot of the qualitative data, which is not presented in our paper, but whereby people are describing uh, detailed aspects of their experience in response to 60 open-ended questions, which we are now currently analyzing. Dr. John Klimo, noted psychologist, uh, uh, is now trying to m synthesize that information. Um, we, we want to get uh, a better handle, yes, on what contributes to p both positive and negative aspects of this interaction. But what is uniquely interesting is that so many say the same thing, regardless of whether or not they're all uh, psychotic or none of them are psychotic or, or maybe a little bit of, <laughs> of each. The, right. point, the point is, our study needs to be uh, independently replicated by other researchers. Mm -hmm. we, in, in, we want to make others more aware of this phenomenon, especially the interaction component, so that when people have such experiences, they, they and they in need of answers, many of whom run to their physician or psychologist for needed validation and, and um, response uh, to help them with their confusion and, and associated fear. Um, we, instead of being prescribed psychoactive drugs, we right. need the medical community uh, to better understand that this interaction is not necessarily a an aberration associated with with one's mind but likely represents a a multi-dimensional experience that is real to the person and not mm -hmm. and not diagnosed inappropriately as a form of psychosis now now it cer that certainly is a possibility but but unfortunately we don't have the support structure the mechanism by which people can um, get the needed support when along the lines that we're speaking about and um, that's so we have to wake up the medical community especially the psychological community in that regard yeah we sure do <laughs> I'm thinking about that because I, I as I listen to you and we, we uh, again a conversation that happens a lot amongst us that are really pushing to shift the paradigm wonder if it will ever happen in our lifetimes. And uh, this would be a whole nother discussion, Bob. But again, I, I have a feeling that we're, what we're seeing, it may not be what it appears to be. This is another discussion I'm, I, that we can't get into today. But in terms of, is there any uh, methodology behind why this vehement denial in our scientific and medical communities at large, are there is there some faction that is well aware of these things that uh, I don't know are a part of at a very high level our scientific and other you know institutionalized uh, you know or institutions again I'm going to trip over my words here because this isn't the proper uh, conversation for that um, we, we've had these conversations I'm not trying to hide anything but I do think that there may be a bit of a conspiracy to keep people in the dark let's just cut to the chase here I don't know I think there's a lot of evidence for that too um, because there's just way too much evidence to, sh to show that we are living in a multi-dimensional universe and that millions no doubt of individuals have been having experiences all of their lives um, we've got to grow up, you know, this is where I get kind of on my soapbox. We really do. We have to grow up spiritually. I have to quote Dana Zohar, a famous physicist who I haven't seen mm -hmm. around for quite a while, but she was quoted as saying, you know, particularly we in the West are spiritually dumb. <laughs> she minced no words, uh, yeah. you know, a bit naive mm -hmm. here and, and, and to our own peril, really. You know, we're never going to evolve if, if we continue to stay in this, this very myopic view. 
You know, along these lines, I, very well said, and I, I resonate 110% with, with your perspective on this. It reminds me of what Nikola Tesla uh, said about the, the paranormal or, or events that simply defy uh, a logical explanation from which there are no scientific principles that can adequately explain them. And he said, essentially, and you're probably familiar with this concept, I forget the actual wording, he says, once science uh, begins begins to seriously study the paranormal will make more progress understanding reality in in, in a decade uh, than than we can in in hundreds and hundreds of years you know going along the same uh, research lines that we're currently undergoing he, he said this <laughs> over a hundred years ago but mm. he, he may very well be right we may by studying this and many scientists are coming aboard um, to this real realization that that consciousness is very likely independent of the brain where is the smoking gun evidence i understand we don't have that 100 irrefutable evidence to demonstrate the the distinction between uh, i and my brain as two separate independent entities but what what we're, we see glimpses of it however in many many different ways which you have written about you speak about with your with your uh, excellent guests uh, we see glimpses of it, yet the scientific community does not acknowledge it as a discipline. Uh, the study of the paranormal and consciousness should be its own unique discipline because the component of consciousness is, is a predominant characteristic of not only the UFO phenomenon, which is, which is valid, um, the who, what, and why is associated with, I have no clue. But people are interacting with beings, uh, according to what they are saying. I, I, have, I believe that they are having that real experience. But the component of consciousness always emerges from many of these studies, mm -hmm. whether it's ESP, NDE, OBE, uh, our study, whereby the vast majority of people contend that their consciousness is separated from their body. About 70% said that in our study, and, mm -hmm. and about 75% said uh, that they felt an expanded consciousness in the presence of these non-human intelligences. Now, the question is, why? Are, are these individuals uh, ha suffering from some type of psychological aberration? I don't think so, because... Mm -hmm such a large percentage out of such a large population database is reporting the same thing and and about 90 percent or so contend that that these non-human intelligences are here among us yeah maybe we can't visualize them possible possibly because they exist in some other space and time that is not consistent with how the the brain perceives that reality but but possibly and i have to emphasize that word possibly mm -hmm. i'm not making any firm conclusions here possibly once we are separated from our brain that is i or our consciousness we are not the brain then does not impede interfere with our ability to perceive all aspects of space and time which might consist of parallel universes with beings coexisting on them with ours allowing us to access it in the manner in which these non-human intelligences seem to be able to access ours they appear and disappear in a blink of an eye where are they going uh, maybe they're, they're turning into the wave there's i gotta bring the, the they're turning <laughs> Which, into the wave they they yeah, are they're well, they have possibly. the ability to blink on and off very possibly, and yes, indeed, and quantum physicists do do use that kind of evidence, which is largely anecdotal, which is which defies logical explanation again, and is inconsistent with current scientific principles, which is obviously why the vast majority of scientific minds or left-brained beings, in a sense, do not pursue it not only for fear of ridicule from their colleagues, of course, but because it is something that is beyond provable at the present time. Mm -hmm. At the present time. Uh, let's face it, we're still in our infancy. We're still at the beginning stages of developing theories in quantum physics, among other disciplines within science, to try to uh, explain, to better understand what 
individuals are experiencing. Right. What, uh, I, I'm experiencing a, a non-human intelligence and a UFO? Well, put this person on some uh, anti-psychotic medication, right? That's that's a, the, the typical type of medical response one is going to receive or time for therapy for you. For some, that is necessary indeed. But I, I think we, go, we have to consider alternate possibilities as if it is really happening and to study it further in order to better understand why people are saying what they are saying, in order to properly diagnose them and provide sufficient support that is unique to their experience instead of dumbing them down and ridiculing right. them and not supporting them in a way that that they need. Right. Beautifully said. This has been, this is, this is great. Well, look, this is where free comes back into action. Because this is what you all are about. I mean, I, folks, if you haven't gone uh, and researched free, we're going to give this a plug toward the end as well. But I want you to go, even right now as you're listening, experiencer.org, experiencer.org, and check out the cornucopia of data. And it's not just data in terms of numbers. It's it's built around these fantastic, uh, fully, um, uh, oh, just, they're, they're just loaded with with information and evidence, and and even a support group. By the way, for those that may have had experiences that don't know where to go, got to go to experiencer.org. I like what Free is doing, Bob, because you're taking the the, the antithesis of a woo woo approach, obviously, and really putting a group of erudite minds together to 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 really advocate for this becoming a discipline. Free has got to have an impact in shifting this paradigm. I can't think of any other organization, and I'm going to say that on the record, that's going at it from this perspective in this way to start taking what I th happen to think is perhaps the biggest story on planet Earth more seriously. That's why we're doing oh, this talk. I can't, I can't agree with you more. Um, and uh, and, and it, it, it serves as a level of great frustration, annoyance that it is not mm -hmm taken more seriously by all concerned, not only the scientific community, but uh, along the lines you're talking about, and thank you for your support of free, it's, it's mm -hmm. very much appreciated, and, and on our website, uh, individuals can access many papers written by members uh, and non-members of free that attempt to try to explain aspects of this phenomena, as well as other phenomena, which we regard as very likely interrelated, mm -hmm. but... Um, it it does it does seem that that these experiences that people have, which we addressed earlier, whether it's UFOs, NDEs, OBEs, even DMT through ayahuasca, um, they are they start to realize with great determination that they are experiencing a, a multi-dimensional aspect of our universe. And once they so-called awaken to this reality, it, it, it serves as a type of catalyst for many uh, means of, of expressing it through a change in, in personal growth and philosophical values. Uh, uh, this awareness or knowledge of other realities and other beings, uh, it, it seems to evoke what, uh, what we often refer to as a, as a trigger, trigger for change. One's spiritual eyes, in other words, may be opened. By this sudden uh, contact with the non-human intelligence, or or one experiencing that they are uh, apart from their body and they're floating above mm -hmm. <laughs> their body and perceiving it, um, even even uh, episodes of precognition and remote viewing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once people realize that this is part of our world, and it, it, and it, they they use often use the term oneness to help describe that that intense or inspiring emotion that that seems to accompany that kind of experience they feel at one with the universe everything is interrelated um you know, you know what i started to do and your listeners are going to laugh i'm gonna mm -hmm. i started to hug trees i don't take trees for granted anymore i don't take animals for granted I, if i may say any <laughs> something to your listeners go hug a tree <laughs> well i listen shh i have a secret 
I hug trees too. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, look, we're gonna. I'm, I have a good a good uh, prescription for you that you can pick up at CVS. <laughs> you know. Well, listen. Uh, when I started doing it just recently, I feel I just have a good feeling. Love I it. can't explain it. Words on capture. Oh, I, just, I love it. Just it feels natural. It feels like there is this knowingness and interconnectedness Absolutely. with another life form. And even if it's a tree, it can't go to Walmart and, and buy, uh, you know, um, something. But it is a life form. Of course it and is. And the question is, why is it there? Why am I here? Why am I having this unique experience? The, and we all we have millions of questions along these lines, and and too few irrefutable answers to explain this all. Um, we do take life for granted. We do take our bodies for granted. Uh, and maybe Edgar Mitchell was right when on his return trip from from the moon he had this so-called trigger for change uh, mm -hmm. and and he said something to the effect that something happens to you out there you develop an instant global consciousness uh, you become intensely dissatisfied with the state of the world and you want to do something about it but he, he said if I remember correctly he called it an interconnected euphoria and maybe that can you imagine perceiving earth from a vantage point you know between the moon and earth it, you can't use language to mm. capture the essence of of feeling that he had and other astronauts who who have it had the same kind of of uh connection realization uh, that he had, and maybe that's what led Edgar Mitchell to f to found the Institute for Noetic Sciences, mm -hmm. uh, an organization that is very much um, geared, shall we say, to studying consciousness. And his papers, which are on uh, our website, can be um, can be accessed to better understand where uh, the quantum theory, the quantum th hologram theory of consciousness. But that may have been his trigger, observing Earth. From space, I can't imagine what it's like. Even John Mack, who a noted psychiatrist from Harvard University, many mm -hmm. of your listeners aware of him, I'm sure you know. Absolutely. Um, he studied uh, several hundred individuals who so-called had a UFO uh, abduction experience, and and he concluded, like we have in free, that that people know their experiences and what they have undergone does not fit in with the the uh, mechanistic worldview. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. 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 And they're beyond it. And, you know, again, and forgive me, folks, they know, my audience knows that I'll go from being interviewed to, interviewer to soapbox ranter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I do think, I mean, I think at some point, Bob, I, I, I have this dream that we'll all wake up and have this grand epiphany and we won't need to question anymore. And we'll get beyond the idea of belief and into the idea of knowing. I can't say it enough. If you know something, there's no need to believe anymore. And I really think that a lot of the people that are having these experiences are in the mode of knowing at this point. There is nothing to believe. Believe is, is something, it's an, accept, it's an acceptance of something that's likely been given to you from outside of you. But when you have the experience, when you had the experience that Dr. Mitchell had and the thousands of respondents that, that had the experience, I don't believe they had the experience. They had it. They know to whatever extent. So I do hope one day we'll graduate uh, to more of a of a. We may not know all of the answers, but I, I do hope that we will graduate into literally the multidimensional uh, reality. I think we'll be welcomed by many of those beings. I think they're waiting on some level. So yeah, go ahead. You yeah. have a uh, you have uh, keen insight along those lines and. Uh, in many respects, one of one is that you're making a, a, a clear distinction between one believing in something and one knowing something, uh, and they are distinctly different. Mm -hmm. uh, I can uh, a large percentage of people in our study n no longer pr practice. Say they no longer practice organized religion, but they become much more spiritual. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, obviously spirituality encompasses religion but but the way organized religion is and i, I don't want to go into that arena but they, they realize is is very good but negative aspects of it as well but they become much more spiritual more aware of that they're distinctly different than their body in fact uh, close to 85 percent now know not believe, but mm. they know that there is a connection between non-human intelligences and the spirit world, mm. and 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 the paranormal, uh, and reincarnation, and the death process. That's why they believe now in life after death. That's why they believe now that they are distinctly different than their con- con- uh, than their body, um, and and that we exist in a multi-dimensional quantum hologram reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're ethereal beings as well as physical, um, and they know that they don't believe it. Right? They, they know. know. Right? Right? I think we're in the habit of saying "believe" because it's just part of our it's part of our lexicon. But uh, yeah, I I would agree with you. We're winding down, and I still have to get a couple of questions. And um, speaking of the respondents, because again, you, th- this isn't just a little focus group, folks. This is how many altogether? For uh, a little over four thousand. A little over four thousand and growing. And l- quickly, can people when they go to experiencer.org, they can access, they can become a part of that study and access it and fill it out themselves anonymously yes. of course yes, okay they can great okay here's a question that i um have been uh wanting to ask and and really um i'm asking it across a broad spectrum of experience uh, what i've been talking about uh now uh, more recently i should say is synchronicity what I, I i don't know that i've coined the term or not whether it's been heard before but synchronicity clusters people that are having groups of synchronicity experiences in a short period of time it seems as though phenomena is on the rise in terms of the frequency. I, when I say phenomena, I mean the broad spectrum, including synchronicity, precognition, uh, NDEs, OBEs, remote viewing, channeling, seeing spirits, you name it. Was there any point in, at, uh, in the survey, Bob, where that was captured in terms of being able to, to glean whether more people are having contact experiences more recently no it wasn't but uh, again another excellent question i i think we need to to look at that um we often hear uh, read about uh, about just that this um what the synchronistic universe uh, it, unusual ex- unexplicable experiences are, are occurring um, more frequently now for whatever reason mm-hmm. uh, who knows why who knows even if it is uh, but but uh, we it, it's it's hard to put a number on it because people often times will not be truthful about it right. for fear again fear of ridicule right. so it's it's hard to quantify it, it is. but but yeah but it is something that should be addressed or shift some emphasis in our research along along those lines but you know synchronicity I'm not I'm not an expert obviously in that area but uh, these meaningful coincidences uh, mm-hmm. you know on a personal level I, I it seems like that's one of the initial steps in expanding one's consciousness they start to have these meaningful experiences and then and then they elevate into other kinds of experiences uh, manifested in many different ways interacting with non-human intelligence is just one mm-hmm. but uh, most people aren't ready to deal with it yeah, um, that, while others yeah. are and the question is you know why uh, for many people it will be too much to handle while others would be more uh, understandable uh, more calm about having a, that kind of experience Absolutely. but we differ considerably in that regard Absolutely. our receptivity yeah oh agreed absolutely agreed Listen, again, I want to urge everyone to visit uh, the free website at experiencer.org. Of course, we'll have a link uh, to the post that will accompany this interview. But I also want you to go to Dr. Bob Davis's personal website, which is also great, chock full of great information. And that is the ufophenomenon.com. I've been to both sites and they're, they're obviously and they're both just brimming with uh, great stuff. Um, a lot of uh, well-researched data. So for those of you who are really looking to dive deep into this phenomenon and not look back from a perspective that's intelligent and thoughtful, F-U-L-L, 
and really scientific as well as anecdotally based, please check out both of these great websites. Dr. Bob Davis, what can I say? You're the best. Thank you <laughs> so much. This is great. This is great. Uh, it's a and pleasure. I don't want you to hang up because I you've given me so many other things I want to say to you. So we're going to sign off for now, folks. And Bob, don't hang up because I wanted to ask you a question or two. <laughs> sure. I appreciate you. Thanks again for joining us. Oh, it's such a pleasure to speak with you as always. Thank you so much for, for doing what you do in so many different ways. Uh, your, your contributions to humanity are pronounced oh. and beautiful. Thank oh. you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you, everyone. Take care. There is indeed quite a curious dimension about what we call ET contact when you juxtapose near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and other paranormal-related events. This is clearly a dot-connecting process that maybe we won't fully understand for many years to come. Still, Bob and I both agree that true investigation into these areas is critical if we as a species are truly going to evolve. The free website at experiencer.org is a must visit for anyone who wants to dig a bit deeper into this phenomenon. I know I'm really looking forward to some of the new and important data that they're working to compile right now. Maybe there will be that one critical piece to the puzzle that's needed to finally give us irrefutable proof that indeed we are not alone. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to Higher Journeys Radio. Until next time, I'm your host, Alexis Brooks.